This is a story about clothing. It's about the clothes we wear, the people who make these clothes, and the impact that it's having on our world. It's a story about greed and fear, power and poverty. It's complex as it extends all the way around the world, but it's also simple, revealing just how connected we are to the many hearts and hands behind our clothes. I came into this story with no background in fashion at all, beginning with nothing more than a few simple questions. What I've discovered has forever changed the way I think about the things I wear, and my hope is that it might just do the same for you. Maybe just start and, and say your name and talk about how this kind of began. My name is Lucy Siegel. I am a journalist and broadcaster based in the UK. And I have been obsessed, consumed with the environmental and social impacts of the fashion industry for about a decade. Well, I love everything about clothes, you know. I love, I love the poetry, I love the fabric, I love the colors, I love the textures, I love the way that they make you feel. You know, they are our chosen skin. Well, I had the classic massive closet, clothes everywhere, bags constantly coming into my house, you know, every day, every other day with some other item in, and never had anything to wear. I could never put together a coherent, outfit. We communicate who we are to a certain extent through clothing and this is this is again throughout history. You know you have the trends at court you know again Marie Antoinette making these huge hats. It's always been it's our personal communication in many ways. That's what interests me that it is fundamentally a part of what um, we wish to communicate about ourselves. And we used to have a system, a fashion system, where people would go to the uh, shows, so they would do spring, summer, autumn, winter, and those kind of ran like clockwork for very many years. Okay, rip that up, throw it out the window, that has absolutely nothing to do with the fashion industry today. It has been reinvented. The shift is moving ruthlessly um, towards a way of producing which only really looks after big business interest. Growing up, I never gave much thought to anything other than the price of the clothes that I bought, usually making choices based on the style or a good deal. Looking back, I learned that for a long time, most of our clothing was actually made right here in America. As recently as the 1960s, we were still making 95% of our clothes. Today, we only make about 3% and the other 97% is outsourced to developing countries around the world. I've been in the business for over nine years now. In terms of scale, we've got about 25,000 people just on the garment manufacturing side. We produce one in six dresses sold in the US. If you actually go to a store and you benchmark the price of a, a garment over the last 20 years, you will find that it's actually a deflationary product, i.e. the price has gone down over time. Now, has our cost gone down? Absolutely not, okay? The cost has gone up. The more production we've outsourced, the cheaper prices have become on the clothing we buy, making way for a whole new model known as fast fashion, almost overnight transforming the way clothing is bought and sold. The newest H&M store on Fifth Avenue in Manhattan is the company's largest ever and just one of many new stores it's planning around the country. It's all part of a high street revolution, fast fashion. Instead of two seasons a year, we practically have 52 seasons a year. So we have something new coming in every week. And fast fashion has created this so that it can essentially shift more product. for $39.
Burgers at Joe Fresh, a brand new store in town. With price tags that might look a little bit more appealing to budget conscious shoppers. American consumers, they really have grasped the fashion part of H&M. And we know from before that American consumers are very value oriented. If you match these two together with fashion and value, then you have a recipe. One Japanese clothing retailer is making a fast and furious mark here in the U.S. The price has dropped. The way of making that product has completely, completely changed. And you have to ask yourself at some point, where does it end? The global marketplace is some place where we export work to have happen in whatever conditions we want, and then the products come back to me cheap enough to throw away without thinking about it. Well, globalized production basically means that all of the making of goods has been outsourced to low-cost economies, particularly where wages are very low and kept low. And what that means is that those at the top of the value chain, they get to choose where the products are being made and they get to switch. If, for example, one factory says, we can't make it that cheap anymore, the brand will say, well, we're not going to come to you anymore, we're going to switch to another place which is cheaper. In the West, they're using everyday low price. So every day they're hampering me and I'm hampering my workers. This is how it is. They are competing, the stores are competing in there. When the stores are coming to us for an order and negotiating, they're telling, look, that particular store is selling this shirt with like $5, so I needed to sell it in the $4. So you better squeeze your price, so we are squeezing. Then other store is coming and selling, hey, they're selling it the $4, so the target price is three. If you can meet the three, you are getting business, otherwise you are not getting. Because we want that business so badly and we don't have other options, okay, every time we are trying to okay, survive actually. Ultimately, something's gonna give. Either the price of the product has to go up or manufacturers have to shut down or cut corners to make it work. Cutting corners and disregarding safety measures had become an accepted part of doing business in this new model until an early morning in April, when an event just outside of Dhaka, Bangladesh, brought a hidden side of fashion to front page news. Well, state media in Bangladesh say an eight-story building has collapsed near the capital of Dhaka, killing more than 70 people. Rescue workers are racing against time, searching through the rubble, trying to find as many survivors as they can. Hundreds are dead, hundreds more might still be buried alive after officials in Bangladesh say factory owners ignored an order to evacuate. Some 400 dead, hundreds still believed to be missing. Garment workers in Bangladesh paying the price for cheap clothing. A huge crowd has gathered near the building site, many of them family members looking for loved ones, and they say they can still hear people screaming from underneath the rubble, crying out for help. Many are simply losing hope. <laughs> Anybody who, like me, had written about problems in the supply chain, particularly for fast fashion, and tried to articulate how the risk was being carried by those who are most vulnerable and the worst paid. You tried to articulate that, but you could never have envisaged that there would be such a catastrophic illustration of what you were trying to say. And Rana Plaza, to me, was like some horror story. Two weeks after the catastrophe, and the death toll now stands at a staggering 931, making it the worst garment industry disaster in history. I think one of the, the, the most 
profoundly impressing things about the Rana Plaza disaster was that news that the workers had already pointed out to the management the cracks in the building. They'd already pointed out that the building was structurally unsafe and yet they'd been forced back in. Many survivors are asking how they could have been forced to return to work when management already was aware of the cracks in the building and workers' concerns on the very day of the collapse. A lot of clothes in American stores are made in Bangladesh by workers who earn about $2 a day. Last month there, a garment factory collapsed, killing more than 1,000. And a few months before that, a factory fire killed more than 100. And as bodies are still being pulled out of the rubble, another factory in Bangladesh caught fire early this morning, killing eight more people. As story after story of clothing factory disasters kept filling the news, it was now the case that three of the four worst tragedies in the history of fashion had all happened in the last year. As the death toll rose, so did the profits generated. The year following the disaster at Rana Plaza was the industry's most profitable of all time. The global fashion industry is now an almost $3 trillion annual industry. Bangladesh is now the second largest apparel exporter after China. How? Well, unlike some of its competitors, Bangladeshi manufacturing remains dirt cheap and unions have limited power. The country cornered the absolute bottom of the value chain. Those 1,000 poor girls lost their life because everybody didn't bother, didn't give damn shit, and they just wanted the cheap price and a good profit. It shouldn't be like that. Everybody should take the responsibility for those kids. That's how it is. And it might coming coming more, sorry, but uh, yeah, you know that it's not only the price pressure, it is something ignoring other people's life. It's, 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 it's not, it should, it should, it, it's not right. It's 21st century. It's a global world we are living and we just ignore other people's life. How come? This enormous, rapacious industry that is generating so much profit for a handful of people, why is it that it is unable to support millions of its workers properly? Why is it that it is not able to guarantee their safety? We're talking about essential human rights. Why is it unable to guarantee that whilst generating these tremendous profits? Is it because it doesn't work properly? That is my question. Lucy's question sounds like the obvious one. But instead of answering it, everywhere I looked, I found people who were constantly justifying the cost because of the economic benefits being generated. So this low-wage manufacturing or so-called sweatshops, they're not just the least bad option workers have today. They're part of the very process that raises living standards and leads to higher wages and better working conditions over time. Your proximate causes of development are physical capital, technology, and human capital or skills of the workers. When sweatshops come to these countries, they bring all three of those to these workers and start getting that process going. Is it possible that sweatshops are actually good? Yes, horrible, awful sweatshops. The word itself, sweatshop, it evokes terrible images of poor people and children suffering in third world countries, slaving away in awful conditions to make products for us selfish Americans. And thank you, what? Does it, does it bother me that people are working in a factory making clothes for Americans or for, you know, Europeans or that they're, that's how they're spending their lives? Or is that what you're kind of asking me? Um, yeah, sure. Um, no, I mean, you know, they're doing a job. Uh, there are a lot worse things that they can be doing. It is live television, and I will ask you, define sweatshops. Yeah, I think we have to be very clear what we're talking about from the outset. So we're talking about places with very poor working conditions, as us normal Americans would experience it, very low wages by our standard, maybe children working places that might not obey local labor laws. But there's a key characteristics of the type of ones I want to talk to you about tonight, Kennedy, and that's that there are places where people choose to work, admittedly from a bad set of other options. Well, I mean, there's nothing intrinsically dangerous with sewing clothes. So, so we're kind of starting out with, you know, with a, a relatively safe industry. It's not like coal mining or natural gas mining or, you know, a lot of things that you can, that 
that are much more dangerous. So sweatshop jobs look like horrible working conditions and wages to anybody in the West who's wealthy enough to own a TV and watch your video. But we have to keep in mind that the alternatives available for these workers aren't our own alternatives. They're much worse than our alternatives, and they're usually much worse than the factory job that the worker has. Low wages, unsafe conditions, and factory disasters are all excused because of the needed jobs they create for people with no alternatives. This story has become the narrative, used to explain the way the fashion industry now operates all over the world. But there are those who believe that there must be a better way of making and selling clothing that does generate economic growth, but without taking such an enormous toll. So we don't know yet um, how long this embroidery is taking. Do you think you could ask Shantu just, yeah. just roughly how long that whole panel is taking? Because yeah. I guess we'll see it later on in the FOB price breakdown, but it would be great to know, wouldn't it? So I'm Safia Mini. I'm founder and CEO of People Tree. And uh, People Tree is a fair trade fashion brand that started over 20 years ago in Japan. You were worried that we had a bit too much navy. What, what are you feeling now? Because we did put more black into SS14, and that has worked really, really mm. well with um, Orla, Orla's yeah. um, designer collaboration. Have we got enough black print in the collection? Uh, well, we've lost that abstract dust print, this one mm, here, mm, mm, in mm, the mm. black. But I think this pink could be really... I think it's one of those prints that everyone's a bit nervous of, but actually will mm. do well. I think most fashion brands start with a, a concept of a collection or a look. Um, they don't tend to think, uh, you know, who is going to make the product and um, how can I ensure that producers or, or suppliers um, are going to eat. Um, so what we're, what we're trying to do at People Tree is really start with uh, the skills that we have at each producer group and then design the collection up whilst also looking at the integrity of the collection in its aesthetic. I worked originally with freelance designers and uh, went into Bangladesh, Zimbabwe, India, Nepal, the Philippines and bit by bit we put together you know an amazing network of like-minded fair trade organizations that put women's development you know, the workers, social development and environment absolutely central to everything they do. One, two, three. Happy, Happy World Fair Trade, Trade Day! Day. そうですね、まあ、世界フェアトレードはあの今日、えー、15年目になるんですけれどもそうですね、まあ、私たちやっぱりあのフェアトレードの運動として、まあ、60カ国以上、えー、そうですね本当にこう10会社からもう本当に60会社までいらっしゃるんですけれども、まあ、今日あの多分3000箇所以上いろんなイベントをまあ、あのここでやってるイベントと同じようにファッションショーとか勉強会とかそういったイベントをあちこち世界中でやってるんです。私の方に向いてもらえますか。足ももっと。That's beautiful. Fair trade is a citizen's response to correcting the social injustice in an international trading system that is largely dysfunctional, where uh, workers and farmers are not paid um, a living wage, and where the environment is is not considered at all to make the products that we buy every day. I'm Chima. I'm our boss. I'm a I'm a Dakar I'm a boss. I'm a bar washer. I'm 
Shima is one of about 40 million garment factory workers in the world. Almost 4 million of these workers are here in Bangladesh, working in almost 5,000 factories, making clothing for major Western brands. Over 85% of these workers are women, and with a minimum wage of less than $3 a day, they are among the lowest paid garment workers in the world. the workers must not have any kind of distrust on their wounds. If they have, there will not be any good working atmosphere in the factory. They must respect. The owner is paying us as per rule. If they do not have this kind of confidence, you won't get the result. it's estimated that one in every six people alive in the world today work in some part of the global fashion industry, making it the most labor-dependent industry on earth. Most of this work is done by people, like Shima, who have no voice in the larger supply chain. But to fully understand the impact that fashion is having on our world, we have to go back to where it all begins. My grandparents settled out here in the 20s. And so this is a part of my heritage. People ask why I'm an organic cotton farmer. It's because I don't know any better. My granddaddy was an old German farmer that felt like we should respect the land, we're stewards of the land, and we respect the life that's in the land. You're actually sitting in uh, the High Plains of Texas, and there's 3.6 million acres of cotton grown in this region. We're literally the biggest cotton patch in the world. In just the past 10 years, 80% of that is now GMO, genetically modified cotton. Most of it is uh, Roundup Ready, meaning that instead of the farmers spot spraying weeds occasionally in their field or hiring laborers to walk the field and eliminate the weeds, now they're spraying whole fields. Cotton produces the fiber that's responsible for most of the clothing worn by the world today. And as our appetite for fashion grows, the cotton plant itself is being re-engineered to keep up. There's been this big drive towards the industrialization of agriculture, the intensification of agriculture. So instead of the old forms of farming, which were very much in tune with nature, they were, they were linked to the cycles of the natural year and the seasons, what you see now is an intensification where the land is almost reconsidered as if it was a factory. What you've created is this general practice of we treat millions of acres the same. We put a dose of chemical on it all, and that's when you get these big ecological effects that nobody has a grasp of what's really happening. 
nature tends to heal itself in small pockets. But when you get this big, broad approach, we really don't know what's going on. For us, it's not reducing the amount of pesticides and chemicals that are going on the cotton. That's one of the big sales, it reduces that. Not in our area where we are spraying millions and millions of acres and dollars of Roundup across the entire South Plains. What kind of impact is that having on our soil with residual residuals that are left at the microbacterial level? What kind of impact is that having on the people in our communities? Where's the cost on that? Monsanto is proud to be the industry leader in agricultural innovation because of what these agricultural advancements can do to help you double yields for the future needs of the world. We're dedicated to the future of agriculture and providing farmers with innovations that help them produce more and conserve more while improving the lives of people around the world. Together, we can face the challenges of the next generation and beyond. After the wars where all these redundant factories that made war chemicals, explosives, uh, were lying around, uh, the Western countries thought that it would be a good idea to market them to the third world. After all, the same industry that makes explosives makes nitrogen fertilizers. And they started to push nitrogen fertilizers from the 50s onwards, after we became independent. But the Nitrogen fertilizers don't do very well with native crops. There's a problem of lodging. So the whole system then organized itself to redesign the plant in order to take on more chemicals. Bt cotton is a cotton in which a gene has been added from a bacteria to produce a toxin. But the Bt cotton, which is supposed to control a pest, has been offered because it's a way for companies to own the seed. By patenting these genetically modified plants, Monsanto has become the largest seed and chemical corporation in history. I wanted to speak with someone who had worked with the company, and I got word that a former managing director for India was willing to talk. One of my close friends who was in the research division working on these modified crops, he came to my hotel for a drink. He was sitting and having a drink, and after a few drinks, he told me, Hey, Jack, we're going to change the type of business you're doing in India. I said, what do you mean? We are going to get into seeds business. And we are going to make the seed business on all crops so that we have the monopoly on seeds. And every farmer has to come to us to buy seeds every time. That rang a bell in my mind. If a poor farmer is to go to Monsanto to buy seeds every time, and such expensive seeds, at the time there's no idea of BT at all for me. Genetically modified seed was not in my mind. Even seed monopoly is something very bad. So farmers get into debt when they get the seed because of the high cost, 17,000% more. They get into deeper debt because it doesn't deliver on the promise of controlling pests, so they have to buy more pesticides. The tragedy with chemicals, whether it's fertilizers or pesticides, is that they are what has been called ecological narcotics. The more you use them, the more you need to use them. For a while, the yield of the single commodity climbs and then it starts to decline because you have contaminated the soil. Most of India's cotton is grown in the Punjab region, which has quickly become the largest user of pesticides in India. Dr. Pritpal Singh has been studying the effects of these chemicals on human health, and his reports show a dramatic rise in the number of birth defects, cancers, and mental illness here in the region. You can go in every village, you will see that uh, hundreds of patients are suffering with the cancers, 70 to 80, 80, 80 kids in every village you will find the men, uh, uh, facing the severe mental retardation and physical handicap.
companies fertilizer pesticides they are totally uh, refusing the uh, after effect of the pesticide and fertilizer and this is the uh, you can say classical uh, symptoms of the toxicity in one village there is 60 amount retarded kids wow. like this this war so it will be very uh, dangerous phenomena uh, in in the wow. punjab <coughs> and pup pupils farmers and labor uh, there is a, a small farmers and a labor maximum the labor means so they can't afford now treatment ultimately they have accept to the death of their kids and they are waiting the death of their kids mother is waiting for the death of this boy companies that make the gm seeds and make the chemicals are the same companies and they also the same companies that make the medicines which they are not patenting so you get cancer there are more profits for them it's a win 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 as for nature and people it's a lose 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 it's the day those agents of these companies come to the farmer and say you owe me this much you haven't paid back now your land is my land that day the farmer will go into his field drink a bottle of pesticide and end his life and every widow i've talked to said and the neighbors came and said they first found my husband lying in the field in the last 16 years there have been more than 250,000 recorded farmer suicides in india that's about one farmer every 30 minutes and it's the largest recorded wave of suicides in history As it becomes clear just how much of an impact fashion is having on our world, there is an increasing amount of research to suggest that it's also having a growing effect on us, the people buying these clothes. What we now know 20 years later and hundreds of studies later is that the more that people are focused on those materialistic values, the more that they say that money and image and status and possessions are important to them the less happy they are the more depressed they are the more anxious they are we know that all of these kinds of psychological problems tend to go up as materialistic values go up now that's really at odds with the thousands of messages that we receive every day from uh, advertisements suggesting that materialism and the pursuit of possessions and owning stuff is what's going to make us happy It's important to understand that advertising is a species or a category of propaganda. We think of propaganda as a totalitarian thing, very grim, loudspeakers, you know, chanting crowds and so on. Or we think of Hitler. We always think of of it as a foreign thing, okay? But it's actually as American as apple pie. Well, the reason that advertising works is because the smart advertisers at least are trying to tie the consumption of their product to a, a message that suggests that your needs will be satisfied by consuming this thing. It wants you to believe that you'll look wonderful in that thing. But then to put it on and feel like, "Nah, you look kind of fat in it. You don't look that good in it. You're sorry you bought it, but there's another one you can buy." Think of all of the car commercials you see that show, um, well, I've really made it now. I'm a competent person because I'm driving this BMW or this Audi. Or think of all the shampoo commercials you've seen where the person now has beautiful flowing hair and is loved and appreciated by the people around them. The basic message is the same. The way to solve the problems of your life, we all have problems in our life. The way to solve the problem in your life is through consumption. Hey you guys. Today I am coming to you guys with a clothing haul. I went shopping a couple days ago and literally went insane and bought so many things. My my spam bots, I don't know. Where is literally blown up by you guys saying you guys wanted a haul. So, here it is. Okie dokie. So, first off, I have some things that I got from H&M. So, then I went to Forever 21. It was
wasn't even a question. It was just like fate. I just had to get it. Like if it could levitate towards me, it would have levitated. I got this skirt, bright yellow, and it was $8.50. It's a jean button up thing. And I just love this. I just loved it, loved it, loved it. It's a gray knit sweater and it has pink hearts all over it. I loved, I love tie-dye things. Like tie-dye things are literally the bomb.net. It has a little yin yang sign on the front of it. I just love these so much. And it's just this really pretty light blue sweater. I don't even know if I'm gonna wear this now that I got it because I don't know if I like it that much. I need to stop. I try to understand better why people doesn't realize that they are becoming poorer and poorer. And I ask myself, okay, but what has changed in spite of when I was young? And fashion is something that has dramatically changed. I was able to buy one, two t-shirts, four t-shirts, for example, a year. Now, I mean, also my, my children, they used to buy every, every party, I mean, they buy a t-shirt. And so I understood that the fast fashion is something totally new. If you have noticed, the price has decreased in the last years and it has followed the middle class disappearing. So all the things that people really need are very, cost, are very costly, like uh, home, like study, like uh, life insurance. Uh, on the other side, there is a source of consolation um, part of their life. I can uh, uh, buy a t-shirt, two t-shirts, a party, or eventually a day. Although I'm very poor and I've got lost, I've lost all the things I really needed. Today we purchase over 80 billion pieces of new clothing each year. That's 400% more than the amount we bought just two decades ago. The way we buy clothes has changed so much, so fast, that few people have actually stepped back to understand the origin of this new model or the consequence of such an unprecedented increase in consumption. There is um, an article in Printer's Inc., uh, which is the leading advertising trade journal of, of, of its day, uh, by a very famous copywriter named Ernest Elmo Calkins, a grand old man of, of uh, the art of writing advertising copy. It was an article called Consumptionism. In that article, he says there are, there are two kinds of products. Okay, they're the kind that you use, like washing machines, cars, and so on. Things that you buy and use for a long time. And then there are the things that you use up, like chewing gum and cigarettes, other perishables. He said, uh, consumptionism is all about getting people to treat the things they use as the things they use up. With their innovative buy one, get three free pricing, a suit from Joseph A. Bank is effectively cheaper than paper towels. And now they come in these easy to use dispensers. With four suits for the price of a modest dinner, I can feel good about throwing them away when I'm done. You just have to look at landfill. And you can see in landfill that the amount of clothes and textiles being chucked away has been increasing steadily over the last 10 years um, as the sort of dirty shadow of the fast fashion industry. As we get sort of closer and closer to species degradation, to uh, trashing our last remaining pristine wilderness, we seem hell-bent on producing more and more disposable stuff. It makes no sense. Fashion should never and can never be thought of as a disposable product. I think after any big change in any industry, it takes a while to sort of to feel and smell the dirt that comes out of something um, that is that is polluting. So I think now there is a change because you can't deny that the fast fashion industry is having a massive impact in developing countries. The average American throws away 82 pounds of textile waste each year, adding up to more than 11 million tons of textile waste from the US alone. Most of this waste is non-biodegradable, meaning it sits in landfills for 200 years or more while releasing harmful gases into the air. The sheer amount of cheap clothing, even though people feel perhaps somehow um, that they're offsetting by giving to charity, you know, the journey of a t-shirt donated to charity is unpalatable in itself. 
Pepe, um, it is a disease in Haiti. And not only in Haiti, I think like you know, in any third world country that you're visiting, like, you know, it's a problem. It's a huge problem. Pepe, a bunch of clothes, most of them came from the States. People will go and buy a box full of clothes. They don't even know what they're buying. Those are clothes people donate to charity and charity cannot sell them on their trip store or whatever. They pack them, ship them to those third country, and most of them end up here. Turns out that only about 10% of the clothes that we donate actually get sold in local thrift stores. And as we're going through our clothing faster and faster, now more of it is being dumped into developing countries like Haiti. As the amount of secondhand clothing coming into Haiti has increased, the local clothing industry here has disappeared. Once a proud local tailoring sector, Haiti now produces mostly cheap t-shirts for export to America. So I'll tell people, stop buying things that is not good, that is costing like you know, $10. You're going to go on a, on a ball, you're going out today, you just go to a store and buy yourself a dress for $10 because like, you know, it costs $10, I don't need it, throw it away. And tomorrow you're going to do the same thing over and over and over again. As awareness of fashion's impact on our world is growing, there are key leaders in the industry who are beginning to question the impacts of a model built on careless production and endless consumption. In Patagonia, we hate the word consumers. <laughs> it's, we've got to find a better word. We, we prefer uh, customers, and we prefer also customers who recognize the impact of their consumption. They recognize that uh, as consumers, they're part of the problem. Uh, we are hopeful that we can encourage our customers to join us in, in really questioning consumption. Because without a reduction in consumption, we don't feel that we'll really collectively find a solution to the problems we face that are collectively, uh, year by year, uh, resulting in the continued decline of the uh, health of our planet. I mean, the fashion industry just needs to think. It needs to just stop and sort of look at how it's been working in a conventional way and just sort of question it, challenge it, you know? And that's, for me as a designer, that's the most exciting thing that I do now. Uh, more exciting than saying, oh, I love this color this season or this is the silhouette or the hemline. For me, way, a, a way bigger challenge and excitement is actually looking at my industry and saying, you know what, I'm gonna try and do it in a way that is not as harmful to the planet. Business through advertising has, uh, has pulled society uh, along into this belief that uh, happiness is based on stuff, that uh, true happiness can only be achieved with, uh, you know, uh, an annual, seasonal, weekly, daily, increasing the amount of stuff you bring into your life. That, that we want to encourage our customers to, to think twice about those assumptions, to understand where they came from, and through that understanding, to know that uh, we can all together, you know, we can change how this is done. The customer has to know that they're in charge. Without them, we don't have jobs, you know, and that is really important. So you don't have to buy into it. If you don't like it, you don't have to buy into it. I love the embroidery, Shantu. Don't you think we should have the embroidery on both sides? I think we should definitely add the embroidery here as well. I think it looks a bit mean to have it just on the front, so let's have it on the sides too. It won't add much cost. It's not so dense, is it? Swallows is a fair trade fashion business, but it's also a development society, so it helps more than 3,000 people in this village. 
I come here every four months. Um, we, we call them production trips, and um, and we're working with the producers, trying to find out, you know, what are the barriers to making a great product and to to getting it to the market. And we're also doing fair trade capacity building, so looking at, you know, what what are the obstacles to delivering more social benefit or improving, you know, the environmental protection in the, in these areas. For me, this, this is about partnering, this is about finding creative solutions together with the, with the team here um, and really listening to what their problems are and finding a way that, that works together. I want to invite um, the best employee here at Swallows. I want to invite one woman, one female representative from Swallows to come to London in autumn or next spring. And I would like you to think who would be that best representative. But I want you to know who your customers are and I want you to really understand the marketplace and come back and tell all your friends. <laughs> Either if she does it single thread, single stitch, then maybe she needs to do more densely, okay. more concentrated. It's a key gap. So, if she continues for a bit, we're going to go up to the sample room now for SS15. Can she come and show us the next one that she does? I kind of hope that people she wouldn't be necessary. And I hoped that you know we would have a trading system that looked after people's rights and the environment. And but the more and more involved I got in developing and working closely with partners, the more you know dirt and, and filth I discovered about how trading practices you know undermine everything that we believe in and everything I know most people believe and value. Um, I don't know, people she just really grew organically. It grew from um, a really great collection of people that feel passionately that there's a different way of, of, of working, of living, of consuming, of you know, interacting with people in a very humane way. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, I, I didn't necessarily feel that there'd be a thousand shops selling people tree today. Um, and I see there's, there's so much more that we need to do. So I think it's not just about you know, creating jobs for the 7,000 people that work for People Tree. It's also about being a catalyst for change, you know, within the industry and showing, proving the model works. Yeah, when we were first in organic, I think there was only two or three of us at the time. We formed the Texas Organic Cotton Marketing Cooperative, and the deal was they'd grow it and I'd sell it. So started going to like Jacob Javits and having this whole deal, cotton plants and everything. And of, yeah, we're, we've got organic cotton. And people would just look at us like we were absolutely crazy. Many times consumers become aware of organic milk or they have an allergy. And so interestingly enough, cotton and what they put on their body, even though the skin's the largest organ on your body, isn't even on their radar screen because they're not getting the connection of, oh, I eat this organic apple. Therefore, I'm not directly ingesting pesticides or chemicals or whatever the case may be. But they don't get that direct connection with clothing. And so you have to start looking at that in that bigger community scope. That it is about our air. It's about our world. It's about our planet. It's about our people. And so it is that awareness of you may not feel that you're having the direct impact by buying this organic shirt. But the impact you're having is in the bigger picture in the world at large and especially in the community where the cotton's grown. As the hard freeze comes, 
As organic farmers, we wait for that freeze because that literally defoliates, uh, takes the leaves off the plant so that when we harvest, we're, the bowls open that are mature and it leaves the cotton here and you can see it kind of comes out in sections. So this uh, machine that's coming is called the cotton stripper and it's called a cotton stripper because it literally comes along and strips, uh, use kind of fingers and it literally strips all of the bowls off of this, this plant. So when you look over there, you can see the harvest has been there and it's taken all the plants off. I think one of the problems that we have in the current model is it's all about the profit. And it doesn't take into consideration at co this cost at what cost? The cost of polluting the water, the cost of labor, the cost of bars on the window that people die when a fire breaks out in the factory, the cost of farmers that don't have access to education and health care. And so we haven't really factored in what the true cost is. Kanpur is situated along river Ganga, which is the holiest river. And it's also very important for 800 million Hindus. And also it serves as lifeline of North India. So this river is being polluted and killed by the leather factories of Kanpur. With growing demand for materials like cheap leather, Kanpur is now the leather export capital of India. Every day here, more than 50 million liters of toxic wastewater pour out of the local tanneries. Heavy chemicals used to treat the leather, like chromium-6, flow into local farming and even drinking water. In places like Kanpur, far from the eyes of the world, Major Western brands are able to source cheap materials while avoiding all accountability for the growing cost to human health and the environment. People in that area are in the tight grip of tannery pollution. The local environment is contaminated, soil is contaminated, the only drinking water source, groundwater is contaminated with chromium. Agricultural produce, even vegetables and uh, salad items are uh, produced there. People's health are affected. People have different kinds of dermal problems, skin rashes, boils, pustules, even numbness in the limbs. People have st stomach ailments. Maybe they have cancers also. हमारी बेटी को जॉइंडिस नाम की बीमारी हुई है और ये प्रतिवर्ष यहाँ पे हमारे जो है इनको भी पिछले वर्ष हमारी वाइफ को भी हुआ था इस पूरे इलाके में जितना भी हमेशा ये मतलब ये घर छोड़कर दूसरे घर में मतलब अक्सर जो है सर दर्जनों लोग जो है हर गांव में बीमार होते हैं जॉइंडिस से वो उनका बहुत पैसा खर्च हो जाता है और ज़्यादातर लोग 90 परसेंट लोग जो है ये समझ लीजिए कि खून की कमी एनेमिक रूप से जो होते क्योंकि जो क्रोमियम है वो सीधे लीवर पे अटैक करता है और जब लीवर कमज़ोर होता है यू कैन हैव द बेस्ट ऑफ मटेरियल्स मूविंग इनटू द हाई एंड फैशन मार्केट इन मिलान और पेरिस और लंदन बटर बीन सो मच ऑफ वर्क विच इज गॉन बिहाइंड इट and so much of chemicals has gone into it. The affluents have been discharged into so many rivers. But we are only looking at that point of time into the finished product. We need to step back and think about it. Fashion today is the number two most polluting industry on earth, second only to the oil industry. The alarming thing is that not only is fashion using a huge amount of natural resources and creating staggering environmental impacts, these natural resources and this impact is often not even measured. Because they've been so abundant, these resources, uh, it's been assumed that they're going to be there forever. Uh, so I think uh, business has not accounted for them because uh, it's only since the 1950s 
that we've really had this industrial uh, expansion at such a rate that we started to see exponential growth and exponential use of natural resources. The first economy on which our lives rest is nature's economy. Nature has an economy. That economy is huge. It's not counted. Then we have people's economy, women working, weavers working, farmers growing. And that was made invisible through this construct, first in the Depression and then during the war years, of the number called the GDP, the Gross Domestic Product, which measures only that which is traded and has become a commodity. A lot of the resources that we use to uh, make our clothing are not accounted for in the, the cost of producing those clothes. Uh, so when it has uh, water uh, that's used to produce clothing, land that's used to grow the fiber, uh, chemicals that uh, are used to, to dye, uh, those things uh, all are inputs. Um, and as inputs, they cost something. Uh, and they also give outputs. In some cases, good outputs, the clothing themselves, uh, jobs but in other cases, bad outputs, like harmful chemicals or greenhouse gas emissions. And those things have costs as well. I'm a Wallace show. 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 I'm a ঢাকা থাকলে আমার মেয়ে লেখাপড়া হয় না তার মানে দুই মাসে আমার মেয়ে একদিন বই নিয়ে বসে না শুধু টিভি দেখে কার্টুন দেখে দেবের গান দেখে কিন্তু দেশে থাকলে আমার মেয়ে এটা পারে না সকালে মসজিদে যায় দুপুরে আবার স্কুলে যায় 8টা বাজে 12টা বাজে আসে আবার 3টা বাজে কোচিং এ যায় এখানে তো এটা হয় না এখানে কার কাছে রেখে যান কে দেখে এখানে ছিল তার কাছে রেখে গেছি আবার আব্বু বাসায় আছিল মাঝে মাঝে তার কাছে রেখে গেছি আবার আমি অফিসে নিয়ে গেছি গতকালকে অফিসে নিয়ে গেছিলাম The same low wages that have made places like Bangladesh so attractive for brands to do business have left millions of workers here working incredibly long hours unable to afford to keep their children with them even in the city's worst slums in order to give their children an education and the chance of a better future than life in the factories Many garment workers here, like Shima, are leaving their children to be raised by family or friends in villages outside the city, only getting to see them once or twice a year. এটা আমার বাবা এক বছর পরে আমার বাবার সাথে আমার সাথে পরিচয় এবং দেখা তাছাড়া হয়তো মোবাইলে একটু যোগাযোগ হয় কিন্তু দেখতেও না আজকে এক বছর পরে দেখলাম এটা আমার আম্মা এক বছর পর আম্মার সাথে পরিচয় উনি মোবাইলে কথা হয় আমার সাথে তো দেখি না আমাদের বাংলাদেশের শ্রমিক তো কষ্টের আর শেষ নাই যেমন আমরা এই যে সকালে উঠি রান্না করি অফিসে যাই সারা দিন পরিশ্রম করি 
এবং সারা দিন আমাদের পরিশ্রম দিয়েই আমরা ওটা তৈরি করি এবং ওটাই তারা বাইরে যখন যায় তখন তারা পড়ে কিন্তু আমরা যে কত কষ্ট করে এটা তৈরি করি কত কষ্ট করে আমরা এখানে চাকরি করে এটা তৈরি করে বাংলাদেশে পড়ে এটা অবশ্যই তারা জানে না তারা শুধু পায় আর পড়ে কিন্তু এটা আমি মনে করি যে আমাদের রক্ত দিয়ে এটা তৈরি হয় যে তো দেখা যায় অনেক অনেক সময় দেখা যায় গার্মেন্টসে চাকরি করতে যায় অনেক মেয়ে গো জীবনও যায় যেমন আমাদের এই কিছুদিন এক বছর আগে রানা প্লাজার ঘোষা পড়ছে আমাদের প্রচণ্ড শ্রমিক মারা গেছে তাই আমি মনে করি এটা আমাদের অনেক কষ্টের পরিশ্রম আমরা চাই না যে আমি চাই না যে বাইরের লোকও এরকম আমাদের রক্তের জিনিস তারা ব্যবহার করে আমরা চাই যেন আমরা আর একটু গার্মেন্টসে উন্নত মালিক যেন আর একটু সতর্ক হয় যেমন রানা প্লাজার ঘোষা পড়ছে আমি চাই না যে রানা প্লাজারের মালিকের মতো আর অন্য অন্য মালিক এরকম রিস্ক নিয়ে এবং এরকম বিল্ডিংয়ে ওয়ার্কারদের নিয়ে কাজ করে এবং আরও এরকম শ্রমিক মারা যায় আরও অনেক মায়ের কোল খালি হয় আমি এটা কোনোদিনও চাই না আমি চাই আমাদের আর একটু মালিক সতর্ক হোক এটাই যেন আমাদের একটু দেখে You know, we are actually profiting from their um, need to work, to use them as slaves. And I'm not saying that we don't, you know, we need to give them work, but it has, they have to be treated with the same respect that we treat our children, our friends. They're not different from us. Livia Firth has been calling for major change in the fashion industry. She made headlines by starting something called the Green Carpet Challenge, urging celebrities and top designers to take part in more mindful forms of fashion. She runs a sustainability consulting firm called EcoAge, and had just been invited to speak at a conference on the future of fashion. If fast fashion didn't exist, we wouldn't need to have a summit in Copenhagen to try and clean the mess of environmental destruction, social justice destruction, that it has been caused in the last 15 to 20 years of its existence. Fast fashion wants to produce fast, so the garment worker has to produce faster and cheap. So the garment worker is the only point of the supply chain where the margin is squeezed. And you have these huge you know, companies going to the factory in Bangladesh, place an order for 1.5 million jeans for, you know, 30 cents each, 50 cents each. How can you make it ethical? I don't know. But also from the consumer point of view, is it really democratic to buy a T-shirt for $5, a pair of jeans for $20? Or are they taking us for a ride? Because they're making us believe that we are rich or wealthy because we can buy a lot. But in fact, they're making us poorer. And the only person who is becoming richer is the owner of the fast fashion brand. So that makes me a little bit angry. You spoke about a commitment to try and, and promise a basic living wage. What does that mean? Uh, how do you define a fair living wage in Bangladesh? You know, um, what does that mean? And I have a pilot project in three factories, and by 2018, 15% of your factories are going to have that. It's not good enough. It's not. It's very clear for us that what a living wage is, is something that the workers should say. And that's incorporated, that's incorporated in our way of working. How much is uh, it? And that's not for us to say a sum, but we do an assessment all the time. How much uh, is it? To make sure that it covers the basic needs of the workers. So it's, I, I can show you that later on. H&M has mastered the model of fast fashion, becoming the second largest clothing corporation in history, with annual revenue of more than $18 billion. They are now one of the largest producers of clothing in both Bangladesh and Cambodia. Sadly, along with every other major retailer I asked, they declined all interview requests for this film. In Cambodia, garment workers have had enough. 
recently taking to the streets to demand a minimum wage increase in the country. As protests continued, workers were met with violent crackdowns as police began to open fire with live rounds. A woman has been killed and several people injured in clashes between clothes factory workers and riot police in Cambodia. Cambodia was a battleground, the city of Phnom Penh. The police, the paratroopers were brought in as if there were war on the street of Phnom Penh. Why? Because workers in the textile industry continue to demand a minimum wage of at least $160. ហើយនឹងជាប់គុំគុំខ្លួននឹងមកភ័យបៃអ្នកហើយនឹងអ្នករងរបួសនោះវាមានសាយសម្ភាក់ជាងអញ្ចឹងយើងឃើញថាអា
you see that workers are increasingly exploited because the price of everything is pushed down and down and down just to satisfy the, this impulse to accumulate capital. And that's profoundly problematic because it leads to the mass impoverishment of hundreds of millions of people around the world. If you write to any of these companies, they'll send you their code of conduct and it's beautiful and it says, oh yes, we take responsibility for the conditions under which our product is made, you know, the product that you buy, all the factories where we produce, we require them to respect the minimum wage laws, you know, all of the laws of the country, to respect women, not to hire children, uh, no forced labor, um, no excessive overtime hours, all that stuff. Um, but when we submitted a bill in Congress a few years ago or worked with, worked with people to do that, we called it the, the Decent Working Conditions and Fair Competition Act, the companies responded in one voice, oh no, that would be an impediment to free trade. We can't, we can't have rules, we can't have, we can't have that. They wanna keep it with voluntary codes of conduct. Now that you know, they've fought for and they've won laws to protect their stuff and their interests. But you know, what about the workers? The workers are left with voluntary codes of conduct. And what we see in case after case after case is that those voluntary codes of conduct are not worth the paper that they're written on. We need to acknowledge, particularly in the fashion industry, that human capital is part of this miraculous formula. Without human capital, without cheap labour, cheap female labour, it would not be generating the profits that it is. That needs to be acknowledged, it needs to be dealt with, and those people need to be rewarded instead of exploited. Where is their piece of the pie? That's what we constantly have to ask ourselves. Are those buyers immoral or do they just don't, or are they amoral? The system they're working for and the system that allows companies to do this is amoral. The individuals concerned are simply products of that system and having to drive it through to its logical conclusion. What we need to do is change the way those companies operate. Operating within a system that only measures profit, companies have little incentive to do anything other than to make this quarter better than the last no matter what damage is caused along the way. As corporations that make up the global fashion industry, major brands as well as seed and chemical companies are growing today to reach unprecedented global size and power. This mandate for profit at all cost is beginning to stand in direct opposition to the values that we share. Richard Wolff is an economist who after graduating from Harvard, Stanford, and Yale became convinced that the real problem is within this system itself. So America became a peculiar country. You could criticize the education system to make the schools better. You could criticize the transportation system to make that work better. You could crit but you couldn't criticize the economic system. That got a free pass. You couldn't criticize, just, you know, and if you don't criticize something for 50 years, it rots. It goes to seed. But one of the ways a healthy society works is it subjects its component systems to criticism so that we can debate it and hopefully fix it or improve it or do better. Capitalism couldn't be questioned. Capitalism is the reason the fashion industry looks as it does today. It's the reason why workers in Bangladesh are paid so little because if you're operating in a capitalist system, the main thing you have to do is create profit and you have to create more profit than your competitors. And this is what drives companies to push wages down and down and down. Like they don't cut, like companies don't go, like fashion retailers don't go to places like Bangladesh for any other reason except they can get the cheapest labor possible. Like there's no um, collective rights in Bangladesh, there's no trade union rights, there's a very, very low minimum wage, there's no like maternity benefits, there's no pensions. That is why the fashion industry is in Bangladesh because it can reap the biggest profits out of those people that are, that are making the clothes for them. Before you can solve a problem, you have to admit you got one. And before we're gonna fix an economic system that's working this way and producing such tensions and inequalities and strains on our community, we have to face the real scope of the problem we have, and that's with the system as a whole. And at the very least, we have to open up a national debate about it. And at the most, I think we have to 
think long and hard about alternative systems that might work better. For the environment, the great threat is that capital must continue to expand infinitely in order to survive. It, it can't have any limits on its expansion and its growth. The natural world clearly does have limits. There are very defined limits to how much the world can sustain in terms of production, in terms of trade, in terms of transport and distribution. And it's quite clear that we've already overstepped a lot of those limits, which is why you're seeing such stress in the natural world at the moment. The system we live in isn't one that most people want to live in. I think it's a system that makes most people very unhappy and I don't think people want to live on a slowly dying planet or to be exploiting um, you know, their neighbours. So I think, I think we need huge systemic change. If you don't change the system, you're leaving intact the decision-making of these enterprises which means a small group of executives and shareholders are gonna be working in the same system, subject to the same pattern of rewards and punishments, which will sooner or later make them reimpose there or elsewhere the very conditions you're fighting against. So stop this stuff about improving their conditions, deal with the system, or else you're not serious. Our economic system is one of consumer capitalism. And that's why the government needs to have consumption at very high levels. Um, and why, of course, the corporations do, and why at some level most people then buy into it. You know, I can't tell you the number of people I talk to who say, well, but if we became less materialistic, our economy would tank. Well, they're right in some level because our economy is based on materialism. It's based on these kinds of values. That's what it needs in order to survive. That's part of the fuel that it needs. The problem is that comes at a really high price. Black Friday's here. Can we go please? Go, 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 go. Shop, 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 shop. Black Friday shopping mania is still playing out tonight at malls across America. In some places across this country tonight, it's as if someone announced we're in danger of running out of stuff and those who need stuff had better go out and buy it now because it's going away forever. Walmart doing more than 10 million transactions in the first four hours of the frenzy. A record 15,000 people at Macy's in New York City. Shoppers hung tough. Black Friday will be the single largest day of the retail year. Certainly in the case of Macy's, we'll do more business on this day uh, than on any other uh, day of the year. Nation, this orgy of Christmas shopping proves America is back. We are once again, yes, oh yes. We are once again spending money we don't have on things we don't need to give to people we don't like. Yeah.
তার থেকে বেশি ভালোবাসা আমার মা আপারা মানে যাই আছে ফ্যামিলিতে দেয় কিন্তু তখন তারপরও একটা জিনিস ভাবে কষ্ট লাগে যে যে যত ভালোবাসা দিউক মানে বাবা মার মতন ভালোবাসা তো কেউই দিতে পারে না ওই জিনিসটা ভাবে অনেক কষ্ট লাগে মানুষ করতে পারবো মানুষের মতো মানুষ করতে পারবো মানুষে গ্রামের মানুষে বলবো যে না সীমা যদি ঢাকা থেকে গার্মেন্টসের চাকরিও করছে তো আমার মেয়েটা ওয়াই টাকা পয়সা খরচ করে লেখাপড়া করাইছে এবং মানুষের মতো মানুষ করে তুলছে এবং যে কোনো একটা ভালো সরকারি চাকরি যদি নিতে পারে কি ভালো একটা ছেলের সাথে যদি বড় হলে আমি বিয়ের সাথে দিতে পারি তখন মানুষ আমারে ভালো বলবে এবং নিজের কাছে আমার গর্ব মনে হবে যে আমি কষ্ট করলাম আমার মেয়েটার কষ্ট করতে দিনে আমার মেয়েটাকে আমি মানুষের মতো মানুষ করে তুলছি married a guy that grew up on a farm and uh, those of us living on the farm and play, you know live there it needs to be safe for us too and and the new chemicals that were coming out and the intensity of the use was just continuing to increase and um, and then in 2005 um, Terry started having some loss of fine motor skills and this and that and come to find out he had a glioblastoma multiforme stage 4 brain tumor and uh, at the prime age of 47 years old and uh, he died at the age of 50 they gave us six months we had two and a half years and the brain surgeon uh, that worked on him we've you know lubbock is got a huge cancer clinics and uh, a hub medical hub uh, we didn't have to go someplace else to have a brain tumor surgery we were able to stay right here because he does so many of them He said that these kind of tumors are found in men age 45 to 65 that work in the agricultural industry or the oil field. And so while I don't have a smoking gun and the blood tests that say the use of uh, cotton chemicals, and agricultural chemicals directly led to my husband's death, mm -hmm. there's just too many linkages with his father's death. Growing up on a chemically intensive farm, we live in the middle of 3.6 million acres of, of cotton that use a lot of chemicals. And so at that point in time, organic is, was no longer important to me. It was imperative. It's imperative that we change agriculture. It's imperative if we're talking about the long-term sustainability and well-being of our lives on this planet and our children's lives on the planet that we have to change. This is the beginning of a turning point, not just for you know, a responsible way of doing fashion, but for a new way of doing capitalism, for a new way of doing economics. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sure that we, we will see a significant change over the next 10 years. Um, whether it's in time or not is another question. If you know Martin Luther King Jr. at a speech in a Brooklyn church, he said that what, what America needed was a revolution of values. It needed to stop treating people like things. It needed to stop treating people in ways that were just about profit, but instead to treat people in a real and human way. My God, we can do better than this. If, if what we want is to spread, as I would argue we do, spread industry around the world, not concentrated in one place. Let, it, let the benefits be shared globally, 
then let's do that in an orderly, reasonable, careful way. We need to recognize that capital is just money. Money is a means, and people should be accountable for how it's used. We need to celebrate the creative power of human beings, and we need to talk of creative work. We must stop talking about labor. We need to look at the land as not a commodity to be speculated on and traded, but as the very basis of our life as Mother Earth. If you change all consumers into activists, all consumers asking ethical questions, all consumers asking quite simple questions about where their clothes are from, all consumers saying, I'm sorry, it's not acceptable for someone to die in the course of a working day. We can't just roll over and say, yes, have it, do what you like. It's too important, it's too significant an industry. It has too much impact and effect on millions of people worldwide and common resources. Will we continue to search for happiness in the consumption of things? Will we be satisfied with a system that makes us feel rich while leaving our world so desperately poor? Will we continue to turn a blind eye to the lives of those behind our clothes? Or will this be a turning point, a new chapter in our story, when together we begin to make a real change, as we remember that everything we wear was touched by human hands? In the midst of all the challenges facing us today, for all the problems that feel bigger than us and beyond our control. Maybe we could start here with clothing. Thank you.